and we're back with the Hammer Podcast. That's right, friends. We're back here on the Excellence in Pastoral Broadcasting Network with half our theological brains tied behind our back just to give the Arminians a fighting chance. <laughs> That's right, friends. We're back in the saddle and we're ready to roll. Before we venture out into our topic today, I, some of the hammerheads have been asking, do we have any updates on the matter? Yes, well, of course, the investigation is ongoing. We have uh, linked together without question. Uh, these are Armenian operatives, uh, along with uh, never Trumpers and, ah. and some others. And of course, uh, we have linked this together. A few years ago, you had on your beautiful, almost brand new 2003 Toyota RAV. Yes, yes. On the spare tire that's on the back. You had not just a normal spare tire. No, it was one of the greatest spare tires of all time. It was the best, the most wonderful, the most beautiful spare tire. And on the cover on that spare tire, you had a Rush Limbaugh. Yes, Maharashi. That's right, sticker. The great one himself. And then out of nowhere, I was driving behind you one day, and I recognized there's no sticker. Then you thought for a second, maybe that wasn't my car. Right. Well... Then when I saw you making all kinds of turns, uh, fast speeds without blinkers, I realized uh, this must be you. But anyway, yes, that that no rush sticker. Right, right. And so then I questioned you about it, and you were like, "What are you talking about?" And you looked at it, and you said, "I I, I don't know." And we could see uh, that the you know the mark that it had left because everything around it was much dirtier. Yes, yes. And we wondered who did that, and where, where where was it parked when that happened. And so we realize now we've been under attack. Mm -hmm. We've been under attack by some Armenian operatives for several years now. Yes. It's all starting to come together. That's right. And so uh, this is not the first time they've done something uh, here hideous, stealing a rush sticker, uh, now hacking into our podcast. So all of this to say that we're taking appropriate measures and uh, we are we believe close to cracking the case so i would just say stay tuned stay tuned all right good i'm glad we've got our our team on this all right well look today hammerheads we have a special treat for you we have a pre-sermon episode instead of a post-sermon episode um you get to have a sneak peek into sunday sermon prep and all that's gone into it but but you have to promise. Vow. Make a vow. Make a vow that you will still attend this Sunday and hear the full sermon preached in its fullest form. That's right. Yeah. In its entirety. In its entirety. In its entirety. And, of course, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper, so uh, that is in and of itself a, a reason to be here. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. So you're going to be preaching on... Jonah as the sign of the resurrection. Now, I, I, most of us, I think, are aware or have heard something about Jonah being the sign of the resurrection. Jesus says the sign of Jonah. But of course, critics of Scripture, um, shall we say, like to think that this is a ridiculous story. Yes. The, the intellectual elite among us they like to say that there's there's no way a man could be surviving in a fish for any period of time, much less three days. Um, so they they obviously they mock this. They say it must be some sort of myth or allegory. Um, and then in more recent times, we see that the Muslim critics have actually tried to use the story of Jonah to disprove. Jesus's resurrection. Yes, that's true. So, th never needless to say, this is a very important and very intriguing topic. So, if we begin, I think the best place is to kind of start setting the context with Matthew chapter 12 and why 
why does Jesus decide to even talk about the sign of Jonah? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, of course, as we've been seeing throughout Matthew's gospel, the Jews, particularly the Jewish religious leaders, Pharisees, scribes, among others, but they're the primary. They have re- the SB, the SBA, the SBI. That's right. Yeah. They, they look. They have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. All the signs and wonders, all the miracles he did, which uh, prove that he was the Messiah prophesied about in the Old Testament. Uh, they just turned around and they said, "No, you know what." We have to come up with something because people are seeing this and believing in him. Oh, you know what? He's doing it by the power of Satan. And, of course, yep. that then becomes uh, what is known as blas- blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is knowingly. See, they know he's not doing this by Satan's power. Mm-hmm. They know he's doing it by God's power because they know only God's power could do this. So they are knowingly attributing the works of God to Satan. Mm-hmm. Right. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's a unique sin for a unique time. In other words, it was something that could only be done uh, when Jesus was on earth uh, by that particular generation, and uh, that's what they did. So, so then as Jesus is scolding them, almost to kind of deflect from that a little bit, they say, well, I, we, you know, we, well, we want a sign. Give us another sign. Now, like I don't, they haven't had enough already. Right, right. Now, I don't think it was genuine, you know. Maybe they were really saying, yeah, I think it was more like, well, I mean, you know, you've done a little bit of this and that, but, I mean, that's not much. I mean, come on, really, give, give us a sign, you know. Give us another sign that we can really believe. Well, Jonah or uh, Jesus then, of course, says, well, you know, yeah, you're going to have this generation, you're going to have one more sign, and that's going to be the sign of Jonah, right? And then he talks about Jonah, three days, three nights, and fish. I'll be in the earth, son of man, three days, three nights. So so we have that sign of Jonah, and that's the context in which it's given. Right. All right, good. Now, maybe we need to address also the issue uh, regards to Jonah, where it's taken mm-hmm. mystically yeah. or as some sort of, sort of awesome, symbolic you know, sign because right. there really wasn't a big fish or sea monster. Right. right? Like they, they got on the premise of, well, there clearly wasn't a fish. So this has right. to be yeah. something other than that. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, obviously, uh, liberal scholars, or maybe we'll just say those who don't have the Holy Spirit in them, uh, laugh at this, mock this story, you know, they'll say it's mystical, it's mythical, uh, it's symbolic. There are even some that claim that the, uh, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to say the story has no truth and that, you know, this never happened completely. So they'll say, well, like, you know, the sea monster or the great fish, sea monster is really a, kind of a better translation. It, it obviously was something, either a, a fish or some sort of dinosaur, water dinosaur, right, that... Uh, God perhaps even especially made for that moment. But nonetheless, they'll say, well, the fish just represents a a, a submarine. <laughs> and so, yes, Jonah was in the water. He was the first Jules but, Verne? Uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but he was a submarine. So so they have a whole lot of, you know, a whole lot of uh, different ways, but to take it rather than just taking it at, at face value. So, But look, there's nothing we're going to ever be able to do. I mean, that's the Holy Spirit has to convince these people that these things are true. You right. Know? So, I mean, there's nothing we can do with that. There are always going to be people that laugh and, and mock God's truth. One thing we clearly know is Jesus looks back, right, and says, hey, this really happened. I mean, he, he validates it clearly. So, Right. Right, right, exactly. Jesus references it as a true, as a true event and being That's a right. sign, the, the last sign that they will receive. Okay, well, so before we get into the... A little bit more of it. Let's let's keep building the case here apologetically. Yeah, because because we're going to go somewhere where the listeners don't yet know. Right, right. So you need to hold on. Right. Just as Jonah went to the depths of the sea, we're going to go to the depths of exposition here. That's right. Amen. And the bars will close down around us. That's right. Um, Excellence in exegetical execution is what we're going to do here today. Excellence in exegetical execution. Amen. All right, so apologetically, what about some of the Muslim apologists and actually others who are using Jonah 
and the events in Jonah yeah. to disprove the resurrection yeah, of the, Jesus. The irony, huh? Yeah, right? The irony of that. You know, how in the world can they take the sign of the actual resurrection and use it to disprove the resurrection? Yeah, right. Well, you know, what they'll do, and of course, uh, uh, rabbis uh, through the years have, have done this, um, but w- what they'll do is they'll say, look, uh, Jesus didn't really die. Oh, okay, okay. He, he, he suffered. He was close to the point of death, but he never actually died. He felt like he was going to die, right? but he didn't actually die. Some people thought he did. Even some of his followers claimed he did, but, but he really didn't. And in fact, in fact, did not Jesus say, you know, this is how they kind of try to trick the Christian. They say, in fact, did not Jesus say that Jonah, being in the fish three days, three nights, was going to be a sign? Mm-hmm. Just as the Son of Man, right? As the Son of Man, or actually says as Jonah. So as and so are two important words there in, in what, verse 40, Matthew 12, right? As Jonah was in the fish three days, three nights, so also shall the Son of Man be uh, in the earth, right? In the heart of the earth, three days, three nights. So they'll take that and they'll say, okay. Jonah didn't die. Oh, he was close to death. All this, it was a terrible ordeal for him, but he didn't die. So if he didn't die and he's a sign of Jesus, why should we say that Jesus died? Jesus didn't die. Right? This is kind of an argument they'll use. Now, of course, we have other verses we can use to show that Jesus died, but this is what they'll say regarding uh, Jonah. Therefore, actually... Taking the sign of Jonah, which, as we'll see Sunday, is clearly the sign of the resurrection, and turning it on its head to deny Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Right. Fascinating. Well, and but it, this, is, this is what we've been talking about all week, kind of leading up to uh-huh. this week's sermon. You know, I've been talking about it. We've been talking about it with Brother Bob and others. Um, yeah, and we asked Bob if he was there when Jonah was thrown overboard, but uh, apparently he was still a few years away from being born. Just a few. We're thinking not many. Not many. Right. Um, <laughs> we love Bob. We love Bob. Now, okay, back to this topic. You know, Jonah being the act, Jonah actually being resurrected. Yes. So we've been discussing, because, you know, when you typically think of Jonah, you think of the fish and the begrudging prophet. Mm -hmm. You don't think of a story of the resurrection. But yet, that's what we've been talking about all week, and and being the connection to the sign. Right. So could you explain that for us a little bit more? And I know you've been numerous hours already into this, and maybe maybe even first walk us through how your sermon prep went this week, and then we'll get into the actual idea of Jonah being resurrected. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I certainly don't want this to be about us or, or me, so I'm just going to say this is the experience God has given me this week, right? I often have people say, how many hours does it take to prepare a sermon? And it's like, well, which one? You know, uh, sometimes during a given week, I might be able to, you know, do a sermon in, in 10 hours. Uh, other weeks, it, it may be 30 uh, 40 hours every once in a while. You know, it just depends, but it might be a topic that other reading and research has been done maybe even, you know, 100 hours, you know, over the last three years on a particular topic, and now this week you're going to preach on it. So, so it's hard to quantify. Right, exactly. Because it, it's not just in that week before you preach it, right? But anyway, th- this week, you know, it all started. I kind of knew where I was going. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper. So I wanted to focus on the sign of Jonah. And so, of course, I go back and, and read Jonah. Uh, that, that's how I begin my Monday is, is to, you know, read that portion again in Matthew and then go back and read Jonah. Now, I did it, to be honest with you, not expecting to, just to refresh my mind. I mean, not expecting to have one of those, I often call it at the time where you're like, whoa, and you spill your, you know, little bit of coffee. Right. Well, th- on your this white one, shirt. Yeah, this one, like, <laughs> 
you know, scalded me, man. I mean, this was like, you know, that dude that, you know, that sued McDonald's for a bunch of money. Yes, that yes. was real smart, by the way. Take a steaming hot cup of coffee and use my, uh, how should we say, my lap <laughs> to say a nice way yeah, as, yeah. you know, as my cup holder. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's pretty dumb to begin with. But anyway. No, no, but it was good for a lawsuit. Yeah, they got their money, right? Well, so anyway, this was like, whoa. So, so I'm reading it, and as I'm reading it, uh, the first time ever. I mean, I've preached through Jonah. Uh, I've, I've preached on a Sunday morning once and taught on it a few times outside of Sunday morning, right? But, you know, it's the first time I really... So I looked at it, and I'm like, wait a minute. It, it kind of looks like... I mean, you could take the wording here as Jonah actually died. Right. Yeah, that's what we've been talking about all week. Right. So then I thought, well, wait a minute. If he's the sign of the resurrection, wouldn't it make much more sense if he, you know, died right, and was resurrected? I'm not saying you have to have that to be the sign, although Jesus himself said what? John is the sign. Mm-hmm. You know, of what? I mean, what's what's important is is three days and three nights. Is it just the time variable that's important? Yeah, or is it the was... actual events? Right. Right. I think it's the events, the death, the burial, the resurrection. So then anytime I have I mean, it's rare to have a to to experience this sort of thing, uh, but when I find something or I look at that and think, man, this might be right, then I always think, okay, I want to make sure I'm not cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Exactly. As Brother Dan likes to say. So I wanna I need to know that Others have seen this, or somebody else is saying that. Right. Now, some of you are listening and saying, oh, yeah, I was reading, and on the bottom of my study Bible, or this or that, it talks about some people believe that maybe Jonah was, you know, this that. I had never encountered uh, anybody suggesting that right. uh, in my study of Jonah. But at the same time, Jonah is one of those books that's easy to preach without doing some deep, uh, you know, exegetical dive on it. Right. Right. So back when I preached on it, I probably didn't, you know, research it or, or it seems like everything's pretty obvious in Jonah. Right. You know, and there's, and Jonah's so practical. It's such a practical book. Right. It really is. So it preaches well. Uh, it's one of the easier Old Testament books to preach because of that. A lot of people, you know, are afraid. That's why a lot of your Sunday school teachers traditionally, Bible fellowship class teachers, they, they don't, I mean, how do we handle the Old Testament, right? Which is understandable. Um, so anyway, so as I began to look, I began to see, okay, you know, J. Vernon McGee, um, uh, you know, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. In fact, uh, I found several Jew- Jewish messianic scholars who take the view that Jonah actually died and was resurrected. And, and part of that is uh, for years they have dealt with arguments from rabbis you know, saying that, well, no, he didn't really die right? because it, Jonah didn't die. So they've had to, in their context, right, and in their apologetic, they've had to deal with that. Right, because that's what one of the arguments for Jesus not being right. resurrected. But the only thing, you know, we, we deal more with the whole people saying, well, they, you know, it couldn't really be a fish, couldn't really been in there three days, three nights, right? Um, we, we're nobody, it, typically, nobody really, which I'm kind of surprised. You know, you would think some unbelievers uh, might say, wait a minute, he... If he didn't die, how could that be a sign, right? Right, right. Uh, so anyway, so as I began to do this, I, I began to find uh, uh, more uh, commentators who are saying, yeah, you know, I, I favor this view. And then there are others who are kind of like, look, it could go either way. Uh, and then there are some that say, hey, you know, I'm aware of it, but uh, I don't really think that's the best way to read it. Right. Now I'm convinced that if we if this is what we've always heard, if if we were always told first, the first time we heard Jonah, and the first time we read Jonah, and if it had always been preached to us and told they actually died and was resurrected, and then somebody came along and trying to say, Well, he didn't actually die, I think we would say we would resist that. But tradition dies hard with us. Yes, yes. So I think because we're so used to hearing his ordeal and that he didn't actually die, that when we hear that, we're like, wait a minute, maybe somebody's reading into the text. And you certainly want to be a good Berean and go through it. Right. And that's what I've been doing all week to the point to where I am 
just infatuated with. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, I I do what I have to do at home, you know, and then I eat dinner, and then I'm right back to the books or listening to a lecture or or, or reading. Uh, I've made phone calls, I've texted, I've sent emails this week, and and uh, I, I'm you know getting some good feedback from some people. But I was just like, man, I'm jumping into this, and I've yet to find anything in the text uh, that would disprove an actual death uh, and resurrection. Right. No, that's good. Okay, so let's walk through it a little bit. Yeah. What, as we were talking this week, you know, you brought up Sheol, and yeah. that you know Jonah says he goes down to Sheol. Yeah. Right. Right. Which I think that's a I think that's something that not a lot of believers, maybe who haven't been studying the Bible yeah. for a long time, they're like, what is Sheol? Yeah, that's part of the issue too, right? Is you know, I mean, here we've preached on Sheol. Oh, I tell you, somebody was asking me for some notes recently, and I went in on my computer, and I had six different lessons on something to do with Sheol through the years. I think I think two were on a Sunday morning, and maybe four for Wednesday nights, and this and that. Uh, you know, Bible fellowship class here, there. So, so we've taught on it, but even so, you have newer people coming in, and yep. so they're not. Aware of Sheol, the two compartments, Abraham's bosom, Hades, and all that, right? Um, so that becomes an impediment for some people understanding. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's fascinating. Look, Jonah, you know, we, we know he's thrown overboard, and, of course, ultimately it's God who uses the instrumentality of these sailors, but they throw him overboard. And then we read, and see, here's the thing. You have to read chapter 2 very closely. But when you read it very closely... You're like, wow. Because what we have in chapter 2 is not one prayer of Jonah, but three prayers. Right. Uh, which is, is pretty remarkable, you know, because you've got the prayer in, in verse 2, right? Jonah pray, or, or chapter 2, verse 1, Jonah prayed from the, to his God from the belly of the fish. Okay, that's actually the third prayer chronologically. And, and in that prayer, verses 2 through 9, right, in that third prayer that Jonah prays, right, uh, we see mentioned in there. He mentions his two previous prayers. You know, in, in verse four, uh, then I said, right. There's there's his uh, his first prayer chronolo- chronologically as he's fa- as he's drowning in the water, as he's sinking in the water. There's his first prayer, and then you go down to to verse seven, uh, and my prayer came to you. Uh, as his life was fainting away, which is a that 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 word faint has the idea of of losing consciousness. Now it can be used of someone who loses consciousness but hasn't died, or it can be used of someone who loses consciousness and has died. You know, so you've got the prayer of verse four as he's sinking, the prayer of verse seven when he's in Sheol, right? Uh, which is the prayer he references in verse two when he says, "You know, I called out to you in in, in the belly." Uh, of the fish, and then he says, verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. Mm. Okay, that goes right with the the, the verse 7. So you got verse 4, verse 7, and then verse 1 of chapter 2, again, is the final of the three prayers, and, and that's the prayer when he's on his way out, getting ready to get vomited on land. Uh, and of course, I'll talk more about, in more detail about this on Sunday, but... Uh, so w- when you realize, okay, there's it's not just one prayer. It's it's one overarching prayer where he's looking back and referencing the two prayers he prayed. Right. As as this ordeal, you know, went on, and he clearly says, right, out of the belly of Sheol, verse two. Now somebody might say, well, wait a minute, be- the belly of Sheol in verse two is just to be seen as synonymous with the belly of the fish in verse one. Well, right. The Holy Spirit is ultimately the author of Scripture, right? Amen. I guess what the Holy Spirit knew, there would be some people that would think that. So you know what he did? He used two different words for belly. One for the belly of the fish, one for the belly of Sheol. Right. Both speak of inward parts. But the point is that clearly grammatically and exegetically, what this indicates to us. Now, you could have the same word, and it could be indicating two different places. Mm -hmm. Because you've got two different indicators, right? You've got fish... And you've got shield. Yeah. So the so, so you could have the same word, and it could mean two different places. 
but you have two different words. Right. So it's almost like the author's letting us know, look, just in case, because somebody's going to come along and say, no, no, it just means the same as a belly fish. And he's going to say, I'm going to let you know. Not only am I telling you it's shield and not the fish, I'm going to use a different word for inward part. Mm-hmm. So exegetically, uh, to me, right, that, that's clear. And then you, you, you read down, and this is a guy who, and look at it this way, verse 3, right? Cast into the deep. Well, do we believe that means he was cast into the water? Mm-hmm. I, I assume yes, yeah, unless right. you're going to say, no, none of this happened. Right. In which case, you've got bigger problems. Uh, so if, if you say none of this happened, I would encourage you to go listen to some sermons by a man by the name of Paul Washer. <laughs> and he'll let you know you're not saved. Yeah. In which case, you're actually not if you don't believe any of the story. But here's my point. If we believe that he that verse 3 says, you cast him into the deep, into the heart of the seas, if we believe that actually happened, right. then why, on what exegetical grounds, a verse earlier in verse 2 when he talks about Sheol, or we just say that's not really Sheol. Right. It's metaphor in verse right. 2, but it's literal in yeah. verse 3. I mean, think about this. The whole Here's part of the irony, right, of what we do with Jonah, is we, we want people to... We, we we want them to believe that it, there was truly a fish and this man somehow was truly in the fish, right? Three days, three nights. So it's almost like we're saying to people, yes, that part is is the plain reading of the text and that's literal, that happened. But everything else around it is poetic and metaphorical and mystical and blah, 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 right? Right, yeah, it's, it's bizarre. Right, so, you know, when you really think about it now... One of the things we do, right? At least what we should do. I know other. I know people don't do it, but exegetically, right? When you're interpreting scripture, one of the obvious principles. In fact, this is how we live our lives, right? Is we take things at plain and face value, mm-hmm. unless there's a reason in the context or something not to, right? Right. So when I look at Sheol, when he says he's in the belly of Sheol. Verse two, is there? It's, so now I want to go through here. I want to look. Is there anything in in here that's going to suggest to me that that's not really shield? Right. That the plain sense doesn't right. make the best. Right. Now sense. a lot of people like to do this backwards, where well, shield really doesn't mean shield here, unless the text, uh, you know, beats us over the head, and makes it clear it means shield. What are you talking about? Is that <laughs> is that how you run your life? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, when you go to the bank and say, hey, you know. I, I'm making a withdrawal. Give me a thousand bucks, and they give you nine hundred bucks. You're cool with that and leave. <laughs> and they say, "Well, you know, I'm just. I, I mean, mean, you said a thousand, but I mean, you know, you didn't really mean that, right? Yeah. You know. So I mean, we don't live our lives that way, right? We we take things at face value, okay? And that's how I'm saying we should do this. But when you read this text, man, you, you're seeing somebody who is drowning, right? Then you get to to verse six, and and you see. His death, what mm-hmm. I believe is his death. Look, right? He, he's. I love how it says the roots of the mountains. By the way, that's a whole other sermon somewhere. But how can there be mountains under the water? I, well, the flood. Right. Of course, the same people that aren't going to want to see a real fish are never going to go with a worldwide flood. Flood, right? Right. Uh, but but he continues to go down, right? And but notice he says, "I go down to the land." That word, uh, that Hebrew word, simply means earth. Right. Okay. Uh, right. So Bottom think about what ocean. Jesus said, yeah. right? Three days, three nights, hard of the earth. So then it says, whose bars, now listen to this, whose bars closed upon me forever. Now what does he mean by that? Well, not forever. Yeah, right. Well, he, <laughs> look, he didn't say I came up to the bars. As I'll show Sunday, there are many times, first of all, bars are the same in the Old Testament as the gates of Sheol. Right. We have numerous verses. I'm going to share some of them on, on Sunday. And sometimes you have... The psalmist, uh, for instance, in the Old Testament talking about that they thought they were going to die. And maybe they didn't die in that situation, but they're like, man, you, I, I, was, I was up against uh, coming face to face with the, with the gates mm-hmm. or the bars of Sheol. Jonah doesn't say that. Jonah's not like a man outside of, of a prison cell saying, man, I'm face-to-face with the bars. He's on the other side. He's in it. Yeah, he's inside of it. Yes. They've closed he, down around right, he's him. Saying, this is, and when he says forever, the point is, yeah, I'm in shield, man. I've died. Right. There's no way There's out no of here. Out. Well, there is one way, right? Resurrection. Yeah. But he's like, man, they closed around me forever, not 
They almost did. I was almost here, right? And then he says, you brought me up, verse 6, you brought up my life, which nefesh, soul, right? You brought up my soul right. from the pit, O Lord my God. That's the resurrection. Okay, look, that's the resurrection of Jonah. And again, pit, as I'll show on Sunday too, but most people probably know, that that is used uh, several times synonymously with Sheol. I think Sheol's used something like 65 times in the Bible, you know. Right. And then pit actually is the next highest uh, used word. I can't remember now. I want to say almost 25 times. Anyway, uh, to speak of of the grave or, or of death or the place of the dead. Right, right. right? The place of the dead. Right. Um, it doesn't technically speak of just a grave like we think, like we bury a person. No, it's talking about where their spirits go, not where their bodies go. Right. So place of the death. So, so once you see this... Uh, I just think it's clear, uh, and when you you know when, so when you put everything together, uh, I would suggest he's thrown overboard as we know. He goes down. We get the picture of what's happening as he's drowning. Right. His spirit then leaves his body. That's physical death. It's in Sheol. His body then is swallowed by this sea monster, mm-hmm. this great fish, and then three days later. His, his spirit, he's brought up from the pit. Three days later, his spirit is somehow put back with his body, and then we get this prayer that he's given of chapter 2 as he's on his way up. That this, this sea monster's taking him on his way up and then vomiting him out, spitting him out on the land. And he says in there, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fulfill my vow. What vow? Well, the vow he made when he was in Sheol. You right. know, he's in a state of disobedience, um, and... He's obviously crying out to God, and you know, I I should have I should have never run from you, boy. I wish I, you know, could do this over. And God says, "Yeah, okay." Now keep in mind, Jonah was a saved man, right? Okay, so he's in the Abraham bosom part, part of, of Sheol. Sheol. Yeah. Okay, and this is the part of Sheol where absolutely we can uh, obviously praise God, pray to God, speak to God. Right. I mean, look at the rich man of Lazarus. Right. right? right. There's a whole conversation going on with. Right. Them. So. You know, so I think that's pretty clear. So anyway, so all I'm saying is that there's nothing in the text of Jonah to suggest that that couldn't or didn't happen. Now, you can take it the other way. The traditional way has been for years. That's fine. But then you're going to have to decide, you know, so so Jesus, like, it works much better as a sign of the resurrection if he actually was resurrected. Yes. Right. Right. Now, am I saying it's absolutely necessary uh, in order for anything Jesus says and for it to be a sign? Now, I'm not saying that, uh, but I just don't think there's anything in the text. And again, you know, we believe in progressive revelation, right? Right. And by that, of course, I don't mean just the book of Revelation, but I mean all 66 books. We believe God progressively reveals things. And so, um, so when we come to the New Testament, think about it this way. In the line of progressive revelation, right? Think about it this way. Imagine that you were there when Jesus said, yeah, this is the one sign I'm going to, one more sign I'll give you, right? You know, sign of Jonah. Now, let's just say you had, let's say you weren't Jewish and you never heard of Jonah. And so you didn't know exactly what Jesus meant at that point in time. Right. But you're going to follow him, right? So you follow him and you see his death. Right. You're, you're there with his disciples as they bury him. And then you see him post-resurrection. I mean, you, you maybe you even go to the tomb, or, or, or the ladies, and the guy, some of the apostles, they come and talk to you on that Sunday and say, man, he's risen, okay? Then you say, man, I, you know, he did say something about Jonah, but I have never read that. Can somebody let me read Jonah? Right. Then if you read it, it, if you read it and no one told you any different, I'm convinced you would read it and say, oh, okay. Yeah, so Jonah this, died. This dude, Jonah, died. Right, and then he was resurrected, vomited up by the fish. Right. So I think, so So if you're back in Jonah's day, right, and you hear this, or Jonah jots it down and you read it, right, are, are you going to know all this? No, you're not even going to know that Jonah, there's no indication that Jonah himself knew he was going to be a sign of Jesus, right? I mean, the New Testament says, what about the prophets? Right, that they speak of things they do not know. Right. And so this would be a perfect example of that. Yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which the entire book of Jonah 
is prophetic, right? And and here this is prophetic of what's going to happen to Christ, and Jonah doesn't even know it. Right. So so I wouldn't expect if I read it back then that I would know it. But think of this, you know, Isaiah seven fourteen. Would we know that that was prophetic in speaking of Jesus if it wasn't referenced in the New Testament? Yeah. And saying, hey, this He's, is Jesus, right? Yeah. We might just thought it was somebody born, a virgin, you know, a young lady, you know, giving birth. Right. Someone in that day. So there are a lot of prophecies like that. If I have time, I'm going to mention this on Sunday, but I don't know if I'm going to have time. Um, yeah, it's but anyway, good. So it's just, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I'm, I personally favor the view, and I think that the evidence is there that Jonah did, in fact, die and was resurrected. It's certainly not heretical. No, no, it's certainly not heretical. And, I mean, it's not like resurrections are impossible or even unknown to the Bible. Well, Look at Elijah. Elisha, they were resurrecting people. So for Jonah to be resurrected sure. would not be abnormal for the biblical right. reader. And look, we can even go back before the prophets, right? We can go to Abraham when he's about to sacrifice Isaac. Right. Right? And of course we know he doesn't, but but we don't know in Genesis exactly what's going through his mind. But then now Hebrews yes. tells us, right? And Hebrews says that he just figured, well, God will just have to raise him from the dead. Right. I'm going to do it, and he'll raise him from right. the I'm dead. Right. I'm going to do it because he's telling me to do it, but he's the promised child, so I can't leave here today with him dead. Right. <laughs> I mean, he has to live. Right. Now, back in Genesis, we didn't know exactly what he was thinking, right? But here, Hebrews tells us what he was thinking. So here is Abraham, way back here, right? Yeah, In way Genesis. Back. And he's clearly thinking of the concept of what we would call a resurrection. resurrection. Yeah. Now, again, we wouldn't know that then. Just like you might read Jonah and say, well, yeah, we, we wouldn't necessarily say it. I mean, the word resurrection doesn't appear, right, there right. in chapter 2, nor did it appear with Abraham there. But we see it in the New Testament. So anyway, so the sign of Jonah, you know, the miracle isn't that he was kept alive in a fish for three days, three nights. Certainly that would have been a miracle, and God could obviously do that. Sure. But I think God did even better than that. Uh, and the miracle is uh, him being raised from the dead, and therefore, indeed, Jonah is the perfect sign of Christ, which is ultimately the resurrection. And why is the resurrection the sign of all signs? I mean, all of his miracles were awesome, all of Jesus' miracles, right? But what does uh, one of my favorite verses when we talk about any of this, right? Romans 1. Yeah. Romans 1, 4 says he was declared in power, right? Through power, by power. Jesus was declared, the Son of God, declared the Messiah through the resurrection. Yeah. So it was the miracle of all miracles. It was the sign of all signs. And Jonah was a foreshadowing of it. Jonah was a sign of Christ because he was resurrected.